Okay. Uh, so I'm, I'm Paul Bonderson. Um, and Tom has asked that uh, I go first. Uh, tonight we're going to talk about what it takes to um, develop uh, an innovative um, uh, company. Um, a little bit of background about brocade so you can see where I'm coming from. Again, my background is in the uh, computer industry. Uh, brocade was uh, founded in, uh, by myself, I was a co-founder of Brocade in 1995. Uh, as the Vice President of Engineering. Um, Brocade provides, uh, base, started its business uh, developing uh, gigabit uh, fiber channel switches uh, f the, and really developed the storage area marketplace. Um, prior to having storage area um, networks, um, large computers or even small computers would have their own individual storage. And that storage was not used um, very efficiently or effectively. You basically had to size your storage for um, the greatest activity that your computer might have. So there was an awful lot of white space. Um, so we, uh, I won't say we invented storage area networking, um, but I think we had an awful lot to do with, with developing that marketplace. And essentially what we did was take um, uh, the storage component of, of a computer, the disk drive or disk subsystem, and uh, apply networking technology, the actual technology that we used was fiber channel, uh, so that we could provide a much more uh, effective and efficient use of, of computers. So we basically did at the back end of the computer what Cisco did at the front end of the computer. Um, so I've got a few uh, notes on what I think it takes to, to um, uh, start an innovative company. And uh, it starts first with a market. Um, you really have to identify a market. Um, uh, and it has to be a real market, something that solves a problem. Uh, again, I think to have a, a successful full company, you either have to solve a problem or create value or, or provide um, some sort of cost benefit um, uh, to your customer, whoever that might be. Um, now this could be a new problem. Again, if, if I take a look at, uh, at Brocade, uh, what we saw was very uh, ineffective use of, of storage. As, as much as 80% uh, of um, a large, let's say, EMC storage array um, would have white space. It was empty, you know, 90% of the time. Um, so we uh, proposed um, networking these so that you could consolidate a number of servers onto uh, a small number of, of, instead of having one EMC um, symmetrics for every two or three, com uh, two computers that you had, now you might share that symmetrics with 10 computers. Um, so again, it's, it, it was an old problem, um, but we, we, provi we, we provided a new technology and could go to a CIO and say, um, so our marketplace was the, the, the CIO and being able to um, uh, give, give that that person a tremendous savings in uh, both his operating uh, expense and his capital expense. So uh, I guess the message I'm saying, one of the things you want to watch out for, especially being technologists here, is, is technology for technology's sake doesn't sell. So you got to go out and find a problem and solve that problem. Um, and uh, again, the, the, the more you can present uh, a, a, um, a cost savings or cost benefit to somebody, um, that's what I'm talking about as far as pro providing a market. Uh, I think you also have to have a clear differentiation from your competitors. Uh, in our case, when, when these storage area markets or networks were starting to develop, um, the easy way to take care of it, it was following the exact same technology path that Ethernet had taken 
uh, a decade before, where um, when Ethernet first came out, uh, it was a hub network. In other words, everything was attached in a serial fashion and had to be passed from computer to computer. Well, as it evolved, uh, uh, switching technology was developed. Uh, and the, the, the wire was no longer shared by all the computers. Each of the computers had their own. Um, so you, you had much more uh, bandwidth available to you. So our differentiation, there were two or three, uh, four or five companies that were trying to develop the storage area network space um, when we first started out. And we said, why should we go out and do a hub? That's an easy thing to do. There's no differentiation from anybody else. Uh, we might do it for a few bucks less than they could. Um, so we said, let's go straight to switching. That's what you know, Ethernet evolved to. So why, why take that first step? Let's just go straight to switching from the beginning. Now, at that time, um, uh, it was gigabit technology. This was 1995. Uh, which was a pretty uh, gigabit Ethernet didn't exist at that time. Uh, or if it did, it was just coming into, uh, it was just starting up. Um, and so to be able to develop a switch, um, we had to use ASICs, um, a very high speed, uh, state of the art ASICs uh, to, to develop the product, which for us was a differentiation from our competitors. The competitors doing hubs, you could do it with, with simple technology that was available to everyone. So there was no differentiation amongst, amongst those other people. Um, I think you also have to have a barrier to entry um, to prevent your competitors from coming in, in just one-upsmanship. Uh, one uh, again, our strategy was to develop uh, very quickly these ASICs. Uh, it's not a simple thing to do, especially back in 95. Um, Tom's company was uh, uh, making tools uh, to do this kind of thing. Um, and so we had a barrier that once we got out there, nobody could um, uh, catch up to us. Or if they did, they'd have to go through an ASIC development, uh, and it would take them you know, at least a year to two years to do that. Um, other barriers to entry are uh, intellectual property, uh, whether or not you know, it could include patents or uh, processes, uh, processes uh, for a, a particular technology um, that give you a cost advantage to something. Um, next in line, once you've uh, identified a, a market that you want to go after, uh, you have to have a vision. Um, every company needs a vision. What is it you want to be when you grow up? You know, is it going to be, uh, are you starting a mom and pop outfit? You're going to have a small family business. Uh, are you trying to make a small technology company that's going to sell technology? Uh, are you trying to be the next Hewlett Packard? You know, it makes a difference in, um, in how you go about developing that company. Uh, you also have to have um, uh, determine what your culture is going to be. Uh, you know, is this going to be um, a, um, a short-term thing or is this something that you're going to try and leave a legacy with? Uh, in the case of Brocade, uh, our vision was to have a very, uh, very high-tech company um, that provided uh, a real high value. Uh, we did not want to be uh, a commodity, uh, commoditized uh, uh, a, a product that would turn into a commodity. Unfortunately, a lot of the switches did turn into a commodity, but that's, that's another story. Um, and um, uh, my, my own personal goal, which was not quite achieved, we said we wanted to be a billion dollar business. So. Uh, putting the infrastructure in place and planning the growth to go from from nothing to a billion dollars is much different than what you would do to try and uh, set up a company that was uh, you know going to be ten people in a in a ten million dollar uh, kind of revenue um, uh, setup um, from the vision um, again in the you uh, that's what you use as the basis for goals. 
again, I'm a very strong proponent of, of what we used to call management by objectives. So you establish your goals and goals have to be meaningful and clear and, and, and really advance towards the vision of the company. If somebody comes to you with a goal that, that doesn't advance you to that vision, then it's, it's not a valid goal. They also have to be very measurable, um, you know, saying something like, uh, I'm going to be a good manager this, this quarter is not a measurable goal. Uh, but you might be able to say, I'm going to retain all my employees. You know, something that's measurable is I'm going to retain all of my employees for, you know, this quarter or this year, and I'm going to grow my department by X amount of people. Those are measurable goals. Um, so, again, I think that, that whatever you do, it has to be goal-based, and those goals have to have metrics that can be uh, measured. Now the big one. Uh, the, the, the next thing I'm going to talk about is passion. You really have to have passion for what you're going to do. Um, uh, I can tell you from my own personal experience that, um, uh, again, it's got to be something that makes you happy. Uh, if you're not happy at what you're doing, uh, you're just really wasting your time. Uh, there's, you know, life's too short. Don't do it. Um, uh, if you don't have passion for it, you're not going to, uh, I, I just, you know, it's a job and, and uh, you know, people that have jobs, they're not going to excel. It's not going to be an innovative company. So um, one thing, one, one downfall that people, uh, including myself, uh, will uh, say is, is their motivation for putting together a company or something is, uh, I want to be rich, you know, so it's, it's a financial goal. And I would say if, 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 if you think it's a financial goal, um, that's not something to start a company on. Um, financial stuff is secondary. Uh, if you really have a passion for what you're doing um, and you do it well, uh, the financial results will follow. Um, let's see. Um, uh, next is leadership. Uh, you really have to have leadership throughout the, the company. And here I'm talking about, this is really leadership versus management. They're two different things. Um, uh, you, hopefully you do have leadership within your management structure. Uh, but I can take an example at, uh, at Brocade. Um, we had uh, my two uh, technologists. I had a, uh, an architect and... Um, um, a software, uh, uh, our chief scientist who was the uh, software architect. Um, those two guys were actually very, very good leaders. They were not managers. They had um, uh, no management responsibility, but they could guide um, through their personal, um, uh, their, their personal power, uh, they could guide the entire company. So uh, leadership's a very important thing. You can have a whole a uh, cadre of extremely smart, hardworking individuals, but they're like a bunch of vectors. If they're all going in a different direction and you don't have the leadership to get those, those vectors all lined up into a, a strong force, you won't succeed. Um, and, and leadership has to be, I mean, it, it's, it's there. It has to be throughout the whole uh, chain of command of the company. Uh, and it's got to be practiced on a, on a daily basis. It's just not something that, um, um, you know, once a quarter you have a, a leadership seminar or something like that. It's something that has to be practiced on a daily basis. It makes a huge difference. Again, in, in our experience um, with uh, Brocade, um, we had uh, uh, a CEO early on in the company that was a good CEO, but he, he was a manager, he was not a leader. And we had a very strong um, executive staff, but we were kind of all going in a different direction. We brought in a new guy, and he was like the, the Vince Lombardi of, of, of the electronics industry. Um, so that leader is really, you know, at, at, at the highest level, or at any level, for that matter, is, is a coach that can get the very 
most out of out of whatever team of players that you have at their time. Um, and leadership is about communication and communicating the vision and always having that vision out in front of 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 everybody in the company. Um, uh, and everything is um, one of the things that I've seen. Um, fail in, in many companies is that everything today is multidiscipline. It, everything is across all departments. You can't have a successful company of, of just engineers or just manufacturing or just marketing. Um, every position within the company is, is uh, extremely important and, and good leadership will pull that all together and, and have it all trying to hit that vision again. Um, the uh, next thing is focus, uh, especially if it's a small, well, a small or large, um, focus is very key. Uh, it's very easy to want to do many, many things, but you're much better off if you do one thing very well than trying to do many things, uh, you know, kind of mediocrely. Um, don't try and do too much. Um, objectives, the other thing is uh, with focus, your objectives have to be realistic uh, and re reasonable. Um, I've been a, always been a very strong proponent of, of pushing those objectives. The, in other words, um, Let's say, again, I'll, I'll use brocade as an example. It might have been uh, typical for 18 uh, to do a, a very large scale ASIC at that time frame in um, 18 to 24 months. Uh, you know, we did it in 15. So um, I, I like very, very uh, aggressive goals, but again, they got to be realistic. Um, do it once, do it right. I mean, there's no, there's no second chance. Uh, don't, don't cut corners. Um, um, and you really need to understand your, your resources within an organization. Um, again, one of the big, big things that I learned, uh, this was at the startup phase of Brocade, is uh, I, I used to think about Kenny Rogers' song, The Gambler. Uh, every hand's a winner and every hand's a loser. So I had this set of resources to use. And uh, if this particular person wasn't working out to the best that they could in this area, well, how can I use that person to, um, um, to uh, better, you know, or get, uh, better the company or get us closer to those goals? And if that person didn't fit in, well, then, that's a discard, you know, and, and you can't, can't hold on to that, um, uh, to people that are not appropriate for, um, for the company. Now, another thing that I've, I've, I've discovered is there are, no, uh, there are very, very few bad people in the world, uh, at least in, in our industry, uh, but there are people that are not, not right for a particular company at a time. So somebody that might be failing at this company can be, uh, a superstar. Uh, we had one case of a, uh, a very sharp um, um, senior, very senior level architect that just wasn't right for the, the startup environment, but uh, he left us and went over to HP Labs and he was wildly successful. Um, so again, every hand's a winner. You know, take what you have and, and figure out how to make, make it achieve your, your goals. Then uh, persistence. Uh, I think it's passion and persistence are, are my two big, uh, big winners. Um, startups can be uh, a huge emotional roller coaster. Um, they're uh, in the early phases of the game. You can be up on the ceiling, happy as can be, uh, for a little bit of time, and then down on the floor. That can happen ten times in a day. You know. <laughs> After, after the company was a year old, that might happen twice a day. After it was two years old, you know, well, it was on a week or a monthly basis. But um, persistence uh, can get you a long ways. Um, and, and that's, I think, where the passion comes in. If you don't have passions, passion for what you're doing, you're not going to be able to persist through the, uh, the hard times. Um, 
and again also to to make it easy to persist the leadership always has to be there and then finally I think um, in any company the value comes down to two things it's the people and the team that you put together and uh, your intellectual property beyond that there's not a whole lot so those were my comments so and those are great what I'd like to do is first of all um, agree with everything that Paul said that'll make my talk a lot shorter I'm sure um, <laughs> So my, my role, and I think what I'd like to do, is talk a little bit about lessons learned. Um, in an audience like this, I know when I was getting ready to start uh, mental graphics back some time ago, um, I went down to the local university and took a class in entrepreneurship to try to find out if I was an entrepreneur or not. And, and I sat out there like you guys are doing and listened to some old warriors like us sitting up here talking about it and the, and you know the main thing that I took away from that the main thing after listening to these people talk for you know some number of hours in this case were much more succinct um, was not whether or not I had the characteristics to do it and and it was not whether or not I had the knowledge to do it or the opportunity to do it what I came away with and and this is what I think you guys should take away from this what I came away with is Man, if they can do it, anybody can do it. That's <laughs> true. <laughs> so what I'd like to do is just talk a little bit about lessons learned um, as, as we go through this. I, I've started um, in, at one level or, or another now three companies. One that I started in my living room off of Sweat Equity, which is Mentor Graphics, and, uh, and was the CEO of for 14 years. Um, another that um, I was the the chairman of in the very early days and helped build it and take it through the uh, initial public offering a company called stamps.com which was my 90s experience in the dot-com world and uh, a third which is my current project if you will and I call it my 21st century company a company called Sensoria which is a wireless wireless mesh networking company uh, doing very exciting things and we'll talk about that uh, in a little bit um, but I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the personal characteristics um, first um, you know I, I I don't think this was in, in the introduction but I actually graduated from UC Santa Barbara so <laughs> yeah go gauchos <laughs> um, and, and I'm ashamed to say but it was in 1968 I, I was 10 at the time um, and and I got an interest in the whole field of technology. I started here at uh, uh, Santa Barbara, having grown up in Berkeley, California, up the road in a little bit small conservative town in the Bay Area. You've probably heard of. <laughs> um, I, I got interested uh, when I came down here. I was an economics major when I started, and I had no idea what economics was all about. After one semester doing that, it meant nothing to me. I had no money anyway, so they were talking about all these big money things that made no difference. Um, and I wound up taking more classes in, in math because it didn't have much reading than uh, anything else. And I actually, in, we're in Engineering 2, I believe, here. Is that, is that right? I actually took in Engineering 1 back in the mid to late 60s, one of the first computer classes that, uh, um, that um, Glenn Culler offered back at the time, which may or may not be a name that anybody recognizes except for some of the old timers uh, in the audience. And that got me interested in the whole field of computers. It seemed like playing a game of chess, you could solve problems and, and whatever. When I graduated, I enlisted in the Army and went to Vietnam and actually took um, my graduate exams to go to graduate school in computer science um, in, uh, in Vietnam, studied with a flashlight in a bunker when I was over there, and kind of got into the whole technical field that way because it seemed like a fun thing to do because of a class I'd stumbled into um, trying to fill out my credits as my rising credit line tried to cross the mark before my dropping GPA line crossed the mark <laughs> in, the, in the other direction, but, uh, uh, but it, worked, it worked out okay. Um, I wound up getting interested in, in entre entrepreneurism, and my whole point of this um, is as you look at what it is you want to do and, uh, and your plans and whatever, that there is no formula to do it. You don't have to have all the credentials and all the education and whatever. You just have to be willing to take a risk and, and have a little bit of a vision. Um, I, got, I got into it because I took a, a rent and MBA class when I was working. 
Um, and I took that class because I had bought a house and I had no idea that banks lent people money to buy houses and high finance, things like that. So I thought I should find out more about that. That seemed like kind of a cool thing. Um, and because everybody else in the class was kind of older and in the middle of their careers, they had an interest in starting companies. And that kind of engendered in me an interest in starting um, companies. Um, but I had no idea whether or not I could do something like that or not. Um, and so I took my entrepreneurship class that I was telling you about and finally decided, literally decided, you know, if these people can do it, anybody could do it. So I thought I'd go do it. Um, and as, as I later t would tell people when I was trying to recruit them into this fledgling, fledgling enterprise, because we had no product at the time that we started the company. Um, our grand vision was we wanted to start a company because that seemed like kind of a fun thing to do. Um, and so I went around and started recruiting people, first of all, with the idea that if you get a bunch of good people together, then you'll probably come up with something and, and you'll be successful. And interestingly, at the end of the day, what we were told by venture capitalists that we wound up raising money from was that what they invest in at the time, this is back in the 80s now, it may have changed, um, are people, 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 and then product market matches. Um, and in fact, uh, again, at the time, what they told us is 60% of the companies that they invest in don't wind up building the product that they raise the money to go off and build. And so what they have to fall back on is simply the people that they have been able to invest in uh, at the end of the day. Um, and so my experience, what we did at Mentor Graphics is I basically got a group of people together, recruited them one at a time, um, a, a five engineers and then a couple of uh, a marketing person and a finance uh, person. Had them coming over to my house, the technical people one night and the other people the other night and I kept getting them charged up about going off and starting this company by telling them how enthused the other group of people were about doing this. <laughs> <laughs> and it was sort of like, these guys are going to do it, so why don't you do it? You'd be silly not to. And then I repeat my spiel the next night. <laughs> Um, and then we finally put it together um, and um, we actually did a little research on some product things and we'd, I, we'd been working in an, uh, an area, I was then a Tektronix, uh, that had done some early research on what was then called engineering workstations, which was kind of a, a, an early but higher end form of a personal computer, but for engineers, uh, if you will, working done at Bell Labs. And we decided that people needed tools to design some of these things, so we decided that's what we we're going to build. So we went out to try to find out what customers need because to kind of paraphrase what Paul said, our, our mantra was basically build what customers want to buy. And if we do that, then we'll be successful. But we didn't have a product. So, and we couldn't build a product, so we built a slideshow. We literally went out and built a 35 millimeter slideshow and we took that around to prospective customers. And we went into them and we showed them this slideshow and basically said, you know, we're building something like this. If we built this, would you buy it? And they said things like, well, that's really good and that's really good, but I wouldn't want that. I'd rather have something like this. And we'd come back and change the slideshow and then take it out to somebody else. At the end of doing that, we basically had a blueprint for a product that we, we went off and uh, raised money for um, and, and built. But again, we raised the money before we had any product to, to build. The first lesson that we learned back then is we, we wrote a business plan, a, a great, glorious, eloquent business plan that I think four people actually wound up reading. Um, and we had um, three of us write, writing it. All three of us had MBAs. Two of the MBAs were from Harvard. So we had, you know, we thought we were, we knew how to write these business plans. We were able to show without the shadow of a doubt that first of all, we could build a successful company where we had revenues per employee of $50,000. This was a long time ago. <laughs> and we had expenses per employee of $60,000. And we were making 10% after tax. So obviously some very creative financing in, uh, in the whole thing. <laughs> And the other thing we could show beyond a doubt was that we could build and grow this company on a total investment of $600,000. We could grow it to a $50 million a year company. And that was what people were looking for then. Five years, $50 million. Interestingly, it hasn't changed too much even today. It's still five years, 50 to $100 million. Um, 
And so we went out to raise our $600,000, and we could show in Excel spreadsheet after Excel spreadsheet why that's all that we needed. Uh, by the time we had finished actually raising money to get the company to sustain profitability, our 600000 had somehow turned into $120 million that we had wound up uh, raising. Um, a, a slight miscalculation in the zeros or something or the rate of growth that, that we didn't know. But the lesson there was when you go out to raise money, always raise more money than you think you need. Yeah. And always raise money when you don't need it. Because by the time you need it, it's going to be really hard to find. And when you don't need it, they're going to be sending you checks unsolicited in the mails. Always raise money when you don't need it and always raise more money than you think uh, you need. Uh, the other thing, uh, the other lesson that we learned in those um, early days is uh, if, if you're going to be in a small company, you give your life to the small company. 60-hour um, weeks, those were the vacation weeks. 80 to 100 hour weeks, those were more the norm. And, you know, in more than a few ways, you know, it's a young person's game. You know, you've got to have the energy, you've got to have the commitment, you've got to have the passion, um, you've got to have the drive, and you've got to have the lifestyle where you're willing to kind of give it all. It's, you know, it's not forever, but for a period of time, it is all consuming, and it needs to be all consuming because if it's not all consuming for you, there's somebody else out there for whom it is all consuming, and they're going to beat you there. So it's a lot of work, but it's a lot of adventure um, uh, at, the, at the same time, and, and, the, and it's a lot of fun. You know, Paul was talking about, you know, one day you're up here, one day you're down, uh, down there. That's absolutely true. The way I would characterize it and, and used to tell people is the difference between being in a large company, I'd worked in two large companies, and being in a small company is in the, in the small company, the highs are higher and the lows are lower, and they come a lot closer together. Uh, and in any given day, it can be the end of the world or it can be nirvana, just because of a phone call you might have gotten the, uh, from someone. Um, so people, making certain good people, making certain that you have the right product market uh, mix, making certain that uh, you raise the right amount of money. So in, uh, in Mentor Graphics, we raised the, in two public offerings, and we, and we went from having no product our slideshow, if you will, to a public offering in um, two and a half years. From the time that we began building the product, it took us about a year and a quarter to um, build, actually build it. And then it took us another year to get enough sales um, as we began to ship it before we did a public offering. Our, our sales, the first quarter of having the product, were 1.5 million. The next year we did 27 million. The next year we did 89 million or something uh, like that. Uh, and the rapid growth there obviously pulled us to profitability. So two and a half years to a public offering. Uh, and that's Mentor Graphics. Mentor Graphics is still around now. It's a, about a seven, eight hundred million dollar a year company. Still a public company. Still independent. It's twenty five years old next June. Um, and one of the the few that has been still independent uh, that that far along. Now, back in the late nineties, uh, I got involved in helping to start a company called Stamps.com during the dot com age. Some of you may remember the dot-com age. It's a little bit of drinking the Kool-Aid kind of thing. Back in those days, people talked about internet time. Everything was internet time. Everything was going to be faster. Everything was about eyeballs and how often people saw various web pages and how quickly you moved and how much money you spent. Stamps.com is a very successful company, is a public company, is still in business and is doing uh, quite well. Um, <clears throat> we raised for that company in a nine-month period of time, during the height of the frenzy for dot-com companies, in a nine-month period of time, we raised $400 million for the company. With no revenues, with zero revenues, zero revenues, and not even an incomplete product, um, we took the company public. The stock went from, in, in a period of not much more than a year, from an initial public offering of 16 to a secondary offering of $65 a share, to $102 a share in a period of about a year to $2 a share. <laughs> and now it's at about $20 a share to, to, to answer Paul's question. Um, and the lessons learned there 
um, and I think the lessons of the whole dot-com era and the whole frenzy um, era is um, too much money is addictive and you can make a lot of bad decisions with too much money. We introduced the first product at that company um, on television with Bob Newhart doing commercials in a $30 million campaign for a product that wasn't even able to ship back then. And $30 million, I mean, that was a drop in the bucket, it seemed, back then, because we were on internet time. <laughs> <laughs> and internet time magnified uh, everything. But there, are, as, as I'm sure you know, there are a lot of train wrecks um, along the way from the dot-com era. Um, there are, you know, whether it's pets.com or it's homegrocer.com or, you know, it's, it's fixmycar.com or, or whatever. There are very uh, few left. But the reason that stamps.com is still around is because they raised that $400 million in nine months. And so when everything fell apart, there was still a lot of cash. And, and the, the one truism, as we were starting Mentor and, and I think... Um, it, you know, it, any other companies seen along the way, is the companies that make it through the downturns, the recessions, the mistakes, the stumbles, are the companies that have cash. So again, always raise more money than you think you need and always raise it when you don't need it. Now my current project is a company, um, very interesting company, um, which I'd just like to touch on for the lessons learned there a little bit, called uh, Sensorius. Sensorius is a company we spun out of UCLA uh, around uh, 2000. Principal is the uh, chairman of the EE department, and the company is in what's called wireless mesh networking, which is essentially is a self-assembling networks um, where the, a node in the network can be anything from a sensor to um, an access point to um, a soldier or what have you. Uh, we do a lot of business with the military. We have products that have been in Afghanistan and in Iraq and out at sea protecting various assets. <laughs> ringing secure campuses and, and the like. And the company is now moving into the municipal wireless space, the municipal Wi-Fi space, which is kind of a hot new space. Um, San Francisco, I don't know if Santa Barbara is doing it. San Francisco and Minneapolis, Philadelphia are cities that are putting in these wireless networks around. A lot of focus on homeland security um, uh, and the like. Um, the interesting thing about uh, that company is um, we originally did a venture capital around and went into a market where the products were absolutely well suited for. Absolutely. It was a telematics market, which is essentially creating the wireless car, if you will. You pull into a gas station, you download uh, the information about the car to the pump, you download DVDs into the car, um, you do a lot of really cool things with it. Um, things that consumers would have loved to have. The only problem with it was that the customers were not willing to buy. The customers, in that case, the auto manufacturers. Um, if, if you think that the military has long product cycles that are difficult to do business with, go after the automakers sometime. Uh, and you can see what, at what speed glaciers will uh, uh, tend to move. And so we spent a lot of time looking at a, a market where customers were simply not willing to buy. A great product and a wrong market. Um, and, and we saw other companies that were competing at that time um, raise a lot of money and go out of business. Or raise $20 million and go out of business. Um, because again, they didn't focus on a market where customers were willing to buy and customers were able to, to buy. So the idea of making certain that you go after a market where there is a customer and that customer is willing to buy has money and there is profitability is important. And the last lesson I think that I'll, I'll pass on and, and then we can stop. Um, and this is a lesson from the dot-com era. Profits really do matter. <laughs> um, back in the dot-com era, nobody thought profits mattered. The old, uh, companies were then valued at a multiple of revenues. Some companies were valued at a multiple of eyeballs that is, people who were actually seeing the product or, or the website, and that's the way valuations were um, constructed. Um, but the big lesson from all of that, um, because people were talking about how basic business principles have gone out the window. This is the internet age. We're on internet time. Things are different. Profits no longer matter. But at the end of the day, the basic principles apply. It's all about making money, creating value for shareholders, creating an environment for employees where employees want to be at the company, competing strongly, and the basic business tenants do matter. 
You cannot spend your way to profitability. That's, that's uh, a lesson that a lot, a lot, a lot of companies have um, not learned and have wound up falling on their sword with. Um, so, just to kind of summarize, the things that I would say is, first of all, I won't speak for Paul, but hey, if I can do it, you bet you guys can do it. You've got absolutely nothing to risk by doing it. I mean, this is what I figured when I went and started the mentor. The worst thing that would happen is I'd go out for two, three years and fail miserably and come back and wind up doing exactly the same thing I was doing before I left. And that didn't seem like a very big risk. And the truth of it is, you know, if you don't get on the, out of the stands, out of the playing field, you'll never really know. So if you have an interest in it, you know, don't, don't sit around and think about it forever. Just go do it. As Nike, my friend Phil Knight at Nike says, just do it. <laughs> so, sure, uh, go do it. Build something people want to buy. Raise more money than you need to raise. Surround yourself with the best people and resources and plan, like Paul said, plan on being a big company. That's what we planned on. We planned on being a company that would have mentor graphics that would last for 100 years. Plan on being a company that would last for 100 years and do the things that you would need to do in order to, uh, to make that happen. Have fun. When you get out there and you start trying to raise money and, and listen to the pundits and things like that, remember that there are a lot of people out there that you'll talk to and that you'll meet that'll have a lot of opinions and a lot of conventional wisdom and a lot of them fall into the category that we used to say and call often wrong but never in doubt. <laughs> so you have to trust your own instincts, you have to trust your own vision, you have to trust your own ability, you have to be willing to take a risk and then just go have some fun and the worst thing that'll happen is you'll wind up in a room like this listening to people like us who, who, you know, had no more, speaking for myself, talent than anybody else in, the, in this room. And uh, you just have to create your own luck and uh, just go do it. So that's my advice. Just go do it. Thank you very much. And I'm sure we'd be happy to take some questions. Thank you for coming. Um, my name is Tam, and um, <clears throat> I was wondering, how do you get people to come out in the first place? Like, how do you invite them to come? And it's your idea. How do you get them to get them to the table? Um, well, I'll start. You can go second. Uh, okay. Yeah. Um, you know, it's it's a sh it's sheer force of personality, and and will it, you 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 have to convince them that your vision is a good vision that it will be successful, that you're someone who can pull it off, and that they don't have that much to risk. Because, like I said, you know, the worst thing that could happen is they'll go and they'll try it. It could be wildly successful. If they're not, they'll probably come back here and do the same thing. Self-assessment, I think, um, if you're going to be a leader in an organization or a leader in general, some self-assessment I think is important. I remember a discussion, a converse, casual conversation some years ago with Scott McNeely, who was one of the founders of Sun, and, and he was telling me how when he was at Stanford, um, uh, and I'm sure, I hope he's not listening to the story because I'm sure I'll butcher it, but um, they were going off to start this company, which wound up being Sun, and he was going to be the manufacturing guy, and um, one of his professors took him aside and he said, you know, you, you're not the manufacturing guy you should be the CEO. You need to look in the mirror and you need to see what other people see in you and you should be the CEO. And so I think that kind of self-assessment is, uh, is important. You know, it's, it's leadership at the end. So again, I was going to say it's, it's leadership and, and what really shows you really have to believe in what you're doing. If you get excited about it, I can think of the, the um, early days of brocade. Um, I was, you know, 90% of my time was, was recruiting. And you have to have a true belief and, and the passion for doing what you're going to do. Um, and that will show through to people. I mean, I used to get so excited. I'd start talking about this switch and get going. And boy, we'd have a love fest right there and I'd have a new employee, <laughs> you know. And, and if you don't have that, they're not going to come. And chances are you're not going to be successful if you're not that excited about it. Um, and, and it was like, you know, to show you how exciting it might be, 
you were talking about 100 hour weeks and, and so on and so forth. I, I more than once, <laughs> I'd get a call, I'd be at work, and my wife would say, hey, are you coming home tonight? I go, sure, yeah, why not? She says, well, do you know what time it is? I said, no. Uh, it's 10 o'clock. Um, oh, okay. Well, yeah, I'll be home. <laughs> so that, it's the excitement, you know, and, and the belief that you have in that product and the belief that you have that, that your company is going to be successful. Uh, what, was, what do you guys think was... What do you guys think was the biggest contributing factor to helping you guys raise money so quickly? Do you think it was just the right timing or the people you knew? Uh, for myself, we, um, again, this was 1995. It was just a little bit before the dot-com era. Um, we, uh, actually, our, our company was started a little bit differently. Uh, the VC was interested in the marketplace and came looking for people uh, and found myself and, and, and a co-founder. And we did basically the same thing you did. We sat down and started brainstorming. We had no product in mind. Uh, but ours was a more traditional um, VC startup. We were kind of an experiment. We started with $1.4 million. Um, and we were incubated. So when we went for our first real round, um, uh, we had some VCs behind us, uh, and we had a good, you know, we didn't have a business plan. We had 12 pages of PowerPoint. <laughs> and uh, believe it or not, in that 12 pages of, of, of PowerPoint, we projected out five years, and we damn near hit it right on the nose um, for what we said. So there was a lot of money around at the time. Um, uh, but people believe it was it was all the team it was a, again like Tom said it's uh, what VCs at least in the VC world what they what they really invest in is people uh, and so you, you know, the the executive team would go off and do road shows to the VCs and they either bought into you or they didn't and our, and our story on that was um, we again we had this grand and glorious business plan which nobody read um, <coughs> And, and we were a new product, and we had a happenstance meeting with a venture capitalist, a good one, who'd come through our area. And by, and by the way, um, Mentor Graphics is in the Portland, Oregon area. So we're not exactly on the beaten track for venture capitalists. And back in 1981, when we were raising money, we were definitely not on the beaten track. So we had a, a venture capitalist uh, come through who happened to be going to a, a meeting there. Um, and. And we had an opportunity to meet with him. We met with, met with him, gave him our elevator pitch. He went back to a dinner that night, and we had all worked at Tektronix. Um, the CEO of Tektronix was at this meeting, and he asked the fellow, he said, well, I just met with these people, and they're trying to start this company. Um, do you know anything about them? And he said, you know, I don't know anything about what it is that they're doing, but I think they're some of the best people we have in the company, and can I invest? <laughs> and at the end of that, Nobody wanted to see our business plan. They just started negotiating terms and whatever, and the whole thing kind of came together. So, and the reason that he had said that and the reason it came together was, again, because of the people, because uh, of the respect for the team. Uh, this question is for Tom. I was wondering, you seem to have taken your companies public fairly quickly, and I was wondering if you'd advocate using that same technique in today's market. Um, you know, the question of, of when to take a company public to me it has a little bit to do with um, whether or not the management team is ready to manage a public company. And I, first of all, I've got to say the rules and regulations for managing a public company today are vastly different than they were in 1984. Yeah. Well, the whole Sarbanes-Oxley, all the scrutiny, all the lawsuits and things, um, that, that's very different. Um, having said that, um, Stamps.com in the dot-com era, we took that company public with no profits and, and no, barely a product at that point in time. Um, today, in 2005, um, I, I, I think you'd have to look very hard at whether or not the management team is ready to do that because it really changes what it is you can do. It becomes a focus on quarter to quarter increases in revenue and profits. And it's, and it's very much, what have you done for me lately? And, and it becomes a little bit of a, 
beauty show with the analysts that follow the company and how well they like you and, and what have you. Um, I, I wouldn't hesitate to take a company public in an early stage if, if it looked like it had sustained profitability and a predictability of earnings and a management team that could handle it. Um, but it would have to have some of those characteristics, I think, before I would uh, rush to do it, especially today. Yeah, and even in today, there, there's not a real good IPO market out there. It's yeah. starting to come back, but... Yeah, if it, well, obviously Google had a fairly successful IPO, so it can yeah. be done yeah. um, if you're in the right space. Yeah. Um, it, it, it would take a lot of thought, I, I think, and the question would be, why would you want to do that? Usually you take it public um, for liquidity, of the shareholders and for valuation, because you'll get hopefully a higher valuation um, uh, there. Um, the, and and if you've only been in business a couple of years, you know, I, we were in business for two and a half years when we took Mentor public. Um, we really took it public because one of our competitors had gone public and raised a bunch of money, and we felt that if we didn't, we were going to be behind the investment curve. Um, so they sort of broke the ice a couple months earlier, and we decided we had to do that to be able to compete. Um, I I would be a little more conservative, I think, today about uh, doing that. Especially, there's a lot of money out there. There's a lot of private money out there. Valuations may not, you know, be, be the best in the world, but there's a lot of money that's out there to be invested. So I might, so I might look privately first. So, what would you suggest to um, someone like me, a student who has an idea that wants to pursue a company, um, where to go to find investors and things like that? Um, well, um, you're, are you a student right now? You're a student here right now. Um, well, I, you know, I would do the business plan competition that uh, the engineering school has here. I think that's a great forum. Um, I would network. Um, you know, if, if you're a student um, or a grad student or a technologist or something, I think the thing to do is to go into this um, with sort of the right expectation. Um, it, it w it's... It would be really unusual. Uh, let me t let me tell it in the form of a story. Stamps.com. Um, the original idea people there were three grad students at UCLA who were working late at night on some sort of I think a humanities project. Had to mail out a bunch of questionnaires. Didn't want to lick stamps. And one of them turned to the other and said, "You know why can't we just put these in the printer and print the stamps?" And and, and therefore the idea came out. But they didn't wind up running the company. Um, and I investors are going to look for more for seasoned management if they're going to put their own money in. So um, s having the right expectation going in that maybe it's your idea, maybe your team, maybe your technology or whatever, but maybe you don't have to be the person, the CEO or, or whatever. Um, maybe a realistic expectation uh, going in. Where would you find the money? Uh, you just have to network. Um, you know, meet. Uh, meet people. Uh, the twelve-page PowerPoint. Um, that's what people do these days. Yeah. They, they don't do business plans anymore. It's an elevator pitch, and it's a twelve or fifteen-page PowerPoint. It's not twenty. It's not. T it's, it's it's a PowerPoint. Yeah, they won't look at it. Yeah, and just just getting uh, their attention. Um, you know, you may have family members that have contacts with investors. There are investors here in the Santa Barbara area. Professors have contacts. There are professors here who have started companies. You just kind of have to network, and that's the thing to do. Just That's what, that's what I did. I went to a conference once and, um, and, and gave a talk, and somebody came up to me and handed me a card and said, well, if you're any, ever interested in doing something, um, give me a call. I mean, and it was just a card. It was, you know, Joe Smith phone number and address. I thought the guy was CIA or something like that. <laughs> um, but you know, when I got ready, I called the person. Turns out he, he was somebody like us who'd been in a company and, you know, helped young companies get going. And I sat down and had coffee with him. And one thing led to another. And I met more people that way. And then met more people. You just network. It can be done. You know, we hear and read so much about changes in the world manufacturing capacity and the intellectual growth in India and the you know, manufacturing in China, all that. Given the current situation in the world, would you germinate different kinds of ideas today than you had 20 years ago? Are there certain things you would steer away from? I mean, where do you think the intellectual edge comes from, uh, you know, here in our society? 
I think one of the things that, that we have going for us in the United States is we have a culture of entrepreneurs um, that's starting to occur in other countries, but um, uh, I, would, I would start here. Again, most of the creativity um, is, is here. There are appropriate things. Uh, it, you need to look at the world. It's a global economy today. And we were talking. I was talking to Chris, Christina about this uh, earlier today. We outsourced a lot of stuff, um, but it was things that, um, you know. Again, uh, we had a huge operating system. Um, how many of you here want to come to my company and uh, sustain two releases ago of the OS? Do you want to come and do that? You know, I can get that done in India uh, for much less than I can do it here, and actually somebody's going to enjoy that job. Uh, so I still think that that um, whatever you know, technology or company you're going to try and start, unless it might be a service company, um, even a service company, I would I would base here uh, and outsource the things that are appropriate to outsource. Um, there's, again, if you look at Silicon Valley, there's more money, you know, there's more VC money in Silicon Valley probably than there is in the rest of the world. So uh, it's still a very good place to start a business. And, and I'm not sure um, if this is an answer to your question or not, but my personal opinion is that there is no better source of uh, techno technology, ideas, and innovation uh, in the world than there is in American universities, and American labs. And if I, if I wanted to go off and find something that I wanted to turn into a company or whatever, that's where I would go. I would go to good uh, American research universities and that's where the ideas are, that's where the research is. And my personal opinion is on a, on a sort of a, a political, economic, uh, philosophical point is, is that one of the most important investments that we make needs to be in education, obviously K through 12, pre-K through 12. Um, and in our universities and our research, because that's where the ideas come from. And if you want a good juxtaposition, look at my state, Oregon, and your state, California, where in California there are many, many world-class institutions. I think, what is it, six, six of the top 20 public research institutions are California, University of California campuses? We have none in Oregon. We have, we have no schools in the top 50 in Oregon, because we have not invested in higher education. And as a result, um, in Oregon, uh, you don't see the same kind of technological ideas and innovation that you see in California. And one of the reasons you see it in California is because of the research at Santa Barbara, at Stanford, at Berkeley, at UCLA, at et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and that's where I would look and that's where I would invest if I were um, running the state. Yes. 